So we're going to talk about the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Three big ideas about him. Number one, killing the bank. Number two, Indian policy. And number three, the tariff of 1828. We've already talked about killing the bank. We'll look at it in closer detail in a second. You've watched the video, I hope. It's been posted for Wednesday and Thursday about the Trail of Tears. And there's some information posted on Thursday's page over the tariff of 1828. But looking at these in a little bit closer detail on killing the bank, I'm talking about the National Bank and the the National Bank served the purpose of being a way to standardize U.S. currency so that all 20 states had a similar money so that it facilitated economic activity. You could trade across state lines using, using a common currency, a common money. Another thing about the National Bank is it was a way to control the economy by regulating the flow of currency. If you find yourself in time of war and you need to increase the amount of money um, available to the government to buy goods, then you can increase printing. If you find yourself in a period of inflation, you need to reduce the amount of money that's being pushed into the market, you can cut back on printing currency. So the National Bank was a powerful tool. Andrew Jackson argued it was unconstitutional and that it was a tool of the elites. And so he wanted it done away with. And so once it's closed off, once it's once it is no longer in service, Jackson rewards pet banks, which are state and local banks that are friendly to Andrew Jackson. And he gives them government business. You're going to print for the U.S. government for your state, for your region. Each bank begins printing its own currency, which is going to lead to a diminishing of interstate commerce because people in one state don't want to accept money from another state. And they're printing at, at an unregulated pace. They print out more and more money to give each state more and more money. Months after Jackson leaves office, the U.S. has its first depression. So it's reasonable to argue that the killing off of the National Bank was a bad move. These days, we have a Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve controls the printing of a common national currency and... Um, when the stimulus payments went out in the past few days, that was to the U.S. Federal Reserve. On Indian policy, we're talking about the Cherokee in Georgia, but there's also Choctaw, Seminoles, and other tribes that are affected by the Trail of Tears, by the Indian Removal Act. But they are in the way of American settlement. And the Cherokee are their own nation within the U.S. and they have signed treaties with the U.S. for the land they occupy in Georgia. And so as the talk emerges about you have to leave, they pull out the treaty they have signed and say, no, we have permission from the federal government to be here. When Andrew Jackson signs into law the Indian Removal Act, the Indians take their case to the Supreme Court. And the case is known as Worcester v. Georgia. And this is a Supreme Court case you need to know. The Supreme Court finds in favor of the Indians. You have a valid treaty with the federal government. You should not leave your land. Andrew Jackson ignores the Supreme Court decision. Two quotes from Andrew Jackson. First one, light a fire under the Indians, and when it gets hot enough, they will leave. And the second quote by Andrew Jackson is, Chief Justice John Marshall has made his decision. He should now enforce it. In other words, telling the Chief Justice Supreme Court, if you want to protect the Indians, you go stand in front of the U.S. Army because we're going to move the Indians out of Georgia. Andrew Jackson ignores the Supreme Court and allows the Indians to be pushed off their lands. They are marched to um, a holding camp, an internment camp, if you will, for the summer months, and it's very hot. Many of them die from heat exhaustion, and then they're told to relocate and move, and they start moving in the wintertime, and they've been pushed from Georgia further north, and so they're going through Missouri during a particularly harsh winter, and many of them die on en route to Oklahoma. This is the Trail of Tears, this mass marching of Indians by foot to Oklahoma. 
Lastly, the Tariff of 1828. This is Andrew Jackson's move to, and is actually passed before he came into office. It's actually Monroe who passed this tariff, but it was the highest tariff in history. But it was very favorable for factories in the North, and it hurts farmers in the South. Now, being from the West, Andrew Jackson really didn't have a dog in this hunt. He wasn't concerned about the tariff. He just liked the idea of more money coming into the federal government. But his vice president was John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. And John C. Calhoun leads opposition to what he calls the tariff of abominations. It's the highest tariff. It's punitive on the South. And so it's an abomination. It's something to be hated or despised. He calls for the state's right of nullification, just like Thomas Jefferson did as vice president when John Adams was president. John Adams had pushed for the Alien and Sedition Acts, and Thomas Jefferson told Virginia, you should just nullify this law. You should pass your own state law that says we are not going to enforce this. On the tariff of abomination, South Carolina threatens to secede. They're going to leave the Union. Uh, it's not 1861 yet because it's 1828, so we shouldn't be having states to see. In another move of his perception of the power of the presidency, Andrew Jackson asked Congress for a force act where it says he will use the army against American citizens to collect the taxes for the tariff of 1828. The uh, eventual solution is there's the passing of a tariff of 1832. It reduces this tariff. But Calhoun, the vice president, says, I cannot be a part of this administration, and he quits and leaves.